Hello everybody and welcome back to Inspirational Landscapes. In this part of the session we're talking about landscapes from an artist's point of view. And I introduced you in the introductory text for this session to the artist Miriam Burke, who in previous years has come and visited us during the uh, during the module and has helped out in a lot of the sessions. And I've just put a photo of Mim uh, on screen here from one of our previous years, just so you can get a feel for uh, who it is that, that's essentially talking to you throughout this session. Because what we're doing throughout this video is based entirely on Mim's previous contributions. I'll be going through the slides with you and telling you about what Mim uh, did and passing on the, the information that Mim included in her previous talks. Uh, but essentially this is a session uh, from Mim the artist. So the session is divided into two sections. This, this video is divided into two sections. We're going to begin by looking at Mim's own work to get a feeling for the kinds of uh, thing that she does and the kind of approach that she has. And then we're going to move on and look at some other uh, contemporary land art, uh, recent and contemporary land art examples. What we're not going to be doing in this session is spending a lot of time looking at uh, classical art. Earlier in the module, we've already talked about some classical art, the romantic movement and so on. Uh, I've mentioned the fact that lots of geographers have done a lot of work on, on, on a few paintings such as Gainsborough's Mr and Mrs Andrews. I'm not going to dwell on that. We're not going to dwell, dwell on that in these sessions. Uh, we're much more interested now in using art as a way of seeing more clearly. The introduction, if you like, to herself that, that Mim has provided for me, she says she's an artist, an artist interested in the way in which many different people respond differently to the idea of landscape. And obviously that's right up the um, right up the line of what we're doing throughout this module. And she says art is not something just for artists and arty people. Anybody, everybody can engage uh, with art in one way or another. And it says, well, geography, of course, is about people's relationship to their environment. And what she's interested in as an artist is the same thing. And she's going to look in these slides I'm going to talk through with you. She's going to look at how a number of other artists, as well as herself, uh, are looking at these kinds of uh, ideas. Mim herself describes her approach, her, her methodology, as a go and see methodology. And if you've read that introductory text that I provided for this session, you'll see that she very much goes on expeditions to places, goes on visits to places and makes art based on her experience of the location. For example, I, I told you the story in that introduction about how we met because she was, Mim was planning a, an expedition to Iceland and was talking, wanted to talk to scientists about Iceland before going and, and making a, an artistic interpretation of the same kinds of things that, that she'd heard scientists talking about. So she came and talked to me about glaciers and then went uh, and made her own expedition to some of the same glaciers and interpreted them in her own uh, special arts way, which was in some ways very different, of course, from the science way uh, that, that I would typically interpret them. And maybe a good place to start explaining the kind of work that, that Mim does would be to start with something which is very relevant to our specific module, which is an expedition that she, she made, and I was a little bit involved in this, because it was an expedition based on those conversations that she and I had when she was planning uh, her Iceland expedition and on the outcomes of that Iceland expedition. And by the time she put this exhibition together, we were already working as a team on the Inspirational Landscapes module, and she was contributing significantly uh, to the development and the, and the delivery uh, in some years of this module. And so she put together this uh, exhibition called Know This Place for the First Time. And of course, those of you who have worked your way through this module will be very familiar uh, with that line from T.S. Eliot, and you'll understand all the implications of that uh, in the context of this module. So Mim's exhibition, Know This Place for the First Time, was a combination of her arts work in Iceland and my science work in Iceland and in Greenland. And this little um, exhibit within that exhibition illustrates the kind of thing uh, that Mim does. She, she looked through all my science work and all my photographs and she was really amused by the fact that Whereas typically you'd expect scientists to be using really precise technical equipment for everything they do. Often, when I'm just photographing lumps of rock or lumps of ice, I just need something for scale, whether it's my ice axe or a dog or anything I've got to hand. But I always tend to have to hand in the field a teaspoon. A teaspoon is the essential bit of field kit. You can stir your coffee with it, you can eat your breakfast with it, you can dig out sediment samples with it. Uh, you can do all sorts of things with, with a teaspoon in the field. And this really amused Mim. So, so this exhibit here, uh, 
uh, is a set of photos, my, my field photos from Greenland, in which I've used a teaspoon for scale. But Mim said, well, if you're going to use a teaspoon for scale, you should really set the teaspoon up to be a good scale. And so she went to a great amount of trouble to create a teaspoon that was engraved with centimeter markings and where the bowl was just the right size so I could have used it to measure out a certain number of millimeters, uh, milliliters uh, of liquid for water sampling, for example. So Mim just kind of took a slightly sideways take on something that she'd observed in my scientific practice and turned it into uh, a, a, a piece of art. And then we had a lot of discussions at the time and in, in the module afterwards, and this is something you can think about. You may well be thinking, well, that's stupid, but a teaspoon isn't a piece of art. A teaspoon is a teaspoon. I'll bring the teaspoon to the live session when, when next we meet and you can, you can have a look at it. But if you look at this picture, you'll see what Mim's done there. She's put it in a glass case on a plinth. And is that in itself a statement telling everybody that no, this isn't just a teaspoon, because we've put it on a plinth, because we've put it in a glass case, does that therefore make it art? Is art simply a question of choice? We choose what is art and what is everyday, what is mundane. Here's another of the things that the Mim made for the exhibition. This is this is a permanent snowball. Mim, Mim always tells the story that she was in the uh, the London Underground down in some hot hot station down in the depths of the London Underground, but in, in the middle of winter and up on the surface, the, the weather was cold and snowy, but it was it's always hot down on the down in the, in the tube. And while she was down there, a little boy ran down, ran down the stairs or came down the escalator and he was clutching a snowball. But she could see the snowball was, was melting in his hands as he stood there. And she, she saw the little boy kind of look at the snowball, look at the time that the train was due, think about it for a minute. And he ran back upstairs and he was obviously trying to preserve this, this precious snowball that he'd collected from the outside world rather than have it melt before he got on the train. And that got Mim thinking about time and permanence and ephemerality in the natural environment. And later on, when she and I were in the, in the, in the low temperature lab at Kiel together doing, doing some work on something else, she, she was thinking about, is there any way that you could make a permanent snowball? And so what we did, or what Mim did, is we, we put some glass sheets in, in the freezer, little, little sheets of glass that you can see here. Here they're stacked up one on top of the other, got them cold, and then we painted on top of them Mim painted on top of the, these glass sheets little circles of, of super glue, circles of different sizes, small ones to represent the top and the bottom of the snowball and bigger ones for the, the middle fat sections of the snowball. Then she went outside and caught snowflakes on the super glue. And by some, Mim calls it some miraculous reaction between the snowflakes and the, and the super glue, somehow the superglue preserved the form of the snowflakes that were falling onto onto the superglue on, onto the cold sheets at uh, the cold sheets of glass and that then even when the the glass warmed up again it preserved the the form obviously it wasn't the actual snow the snow would have, would have melted or disappeared but the superglue had preserved the exact form of the snowflakes uh, the layers of snow mim then stacked up the layers of glass in the correct sequence and ended up with these um these three-dimensional um what preserved uh, permanent fossilized if you like uh, snowballs She then used these snowballs as the centerpiece of the ex exhibition. It doesn't show up terribly well in this photograph, um, but with a little bit of imagination, you, you can hopefully picture uh, the idea of these snowballs as they looked in real life. As you walk around them and go closer to them and further away from them, you can see that they're within sheets of glass, but they almost look like little caged actual snowballs. And they were suspended there uh, in, in the middle of the gallery with, with other um, exhibits all around them and, and visitors could walk around and look at the snowballs and look at the other exhibits and, and so on. And those other exhibits included some scientific paraphernalia from me, some, some maps, some scientific, some scientific data uh, collected from glaciers, but then a whole series of photographs that Mim had made based on her observations of glaciers. Now, remember what we've talked about through the, throughout this module. It's all about choosing what to notice. So I might go to a glacier and choose to notice the crystal structure and the isotopic composition and the advance and retreat and all this sciencey stuff that we're asking specific questions because we're scientists. Science is good at certain things. It's not good at religion it's not good at art and so on well when an artist goes there what does the artist notice 
And so Mim took uh, photos of things that she was noticing. And one of the, one of the photos was, was these, I'm not sure if some of you might have been to Iceland and you might have seen these, but on a number of Icelandic glaciers, some of the stones on the glacier surface have accumulated this coating of moss. And so they're like little, in Mim's eyes, they're like little living things being carried slowly to the front of the glacier over long periods of time, slowly developing this mossy coating like a, like a living thing uh, growing and in, the, in the heart of the, the ball of moss eventually is a little nucleus from which it all started. And then how does this story end? Well, I was impressed by the way that after, after all this time, after all this long journey from high up on the glacier towards the edge, they just plopped off the front of the glacier into the lake and, and they, were, they were gone. So it's a different kind of a story that the artist picks up on and is interested in from the landscape. No less valid or worthwhile or interesting than a scientist's story. Just different. We're asking questions about different things. We're noticing different things sometimes. We're interested in different things. Now, a lot of Mim's work has been based on this, this kind of idea of going somewhere and noticing things about the landscape and making art that reflected both herself in the landscape, her act of traveling and her act of being there and aspects of the landscape uh, itself. So from a different expedition, this is an expedition she made uh, to the island of Mull on uh, the west coast of Scotland. And as part of the idea of a journey, she made a, a model, paper sculpture, of a suitcase, the, the suitcase that she used for her, for her trip. But then onto the surface, onto the lid of this suitcase, she sculpted a map of the topography of Mull with cut out strips of paper held up, held in place as a three-dimensional di three model uh, by pins on the surface of the suitcase. So zooming in on it, here you can just about pick out this, this item, this, this, this piece, mole topography, uh, and you can see there's some water in the top right there, the, the, the flat uh, inlet or lake, and then the contours are picked out really carefully with this cut paper held up to the right levels uh, by these pins. So it's a particular interpretation of the landscape, but it's a, in a sense, we can look at that and think, oh, that's geography, that's a geographical interpretation. And there's a, there's a very clear overlap here between Mim's art and our geography. We're both interested in shapes of the land, contours on the land. Now here's a, a piece based on a much smaller scale expedition, if you like, although I think this was actually still on the island of Mull as part of that expedition. But instead of looking at the whole island here, Mim's looking at just a single wheelie bin or a row of wheelie bins in the snow. And some of you, if you from the, if you remember um, your time in the William Smith building, you'll, you'll remember this being uh, mounted on the wall close to the photocopier on the upstairs landing. It's been on display in our in our building for uh, for a while now, so you might remember this. But it's a row of wheelie bins in the snow. And here's a, a close up of one of the one of the wheelie bins. But again, it just gives you that impression of contours as the snow is sticking to some bits of the bin, thicker in some places, thinner in other places. And all Mim is doing here is, again, she's choosing what to include in her picture. So she's including the snow, but not including other things. So bits of the bin where there, there is no snow, well, they're not in the picture. By drawing the snow, we're identifying, and you can still pick out here with the wheels and the lid and the body of the bin, you can pick out the bin, even though we're not actually drawing the bin, we're drawing the snow on the bin. And we're going to talk later on about negative space, drawing not the thing itself, but the space around a thing and noticing more about the thing by looking at the space around it rather than looking directly at it in the same way that when you look at the stars, often depending on your, your eyesight, if your eyesight's not that hot, if you look slightly to the side of something, you actually see it much more clearly because your peripheral vision is in some circumstances sharper than your central vision. So you often see things more clearly by looking slightly to the side. You sometimes, as in here, can observe something very effectively, not by looking at the thing itself, but by looking at the things that surround it or are draped over it or the negative space associated with it. And here we're dropping down another scale, although at first glance looking at this picture you might think you're looking at the picture of a, a, a topographic feature, a mountain range uh, in, in Mull for example, but you're not. This is something quite different and this is something we 
uh, came up with, um, with, has featured a lot in, in my conversations with Mim in the past, this idea of making art with the thing itself that you're making art of. And so what happened here is that Mim had a piece of chalk and wanted to make, make art about this chalk. So it's a bit of the natural landscape and we tried, we're thinking about, well, how might we make art about this object, about this thing? And what Mim came up with, what she did, was she drew the piece of chalk that she was holding, but she drew it with itself, with the piece of chalk itself. And she kept drawing and kept working on this drawing until all the chalk was finally used up. So this picture of a piece of chalk is the chalk itself, but now transferred onto paper, and the original object has disappeared, and the only record we now have of it is this picture that she made with it, which is, in a way, the chalk itself, because it is the chalk dust, if you like, on the paper. So again, we have a really close connection here between the original landscape item, the rock, the lump, lump of chalk, and the final artwork that emerged from it. So this is much more than just a drawing of a piece of chalk. The drawing is now the piece of chalk. Here's another of Mim's pieces, and this is tiny. This is a, a pin, um, like a sewing pin, with a tiny little bit of wax, kind of melted melted, melted wax put on top of a, a finger or a thumb to turn into this little uh, lid shape or umbrella shape, and, and popped on top of the pin, then the pin stuck in the ground. And here Mim's starting to think about environmental change, climate change, environmental art. And what she's thinking about here is the idea of albedo, the reflectivity of the Earth's surface, and also about the way in which we can each make our own tiny contribution in the same way that art isn't just for arty people. Environmental change doesn't just have to be, um, you know, envi environmental concern doesn't just have to be for environmentalists. We can all make a, a our own tiny little contribution. So Mim's idea was that we could just stick a little umbrella of white wax uh, in, in the ground somewhere, and in doing so, change uh, the albedo. Of, of the Earth's surface. Now, from a science point of view, you might think, well, that's crazy, that's so small, that's nothing. But the idea of it, from an art point of view, it's something you can pick up and run with, which is what Mim did. And for an exhibition that she had uh, in, in London, she put these tiny little albedo pins all around the exhibition space. I always worry about health and safety and treading on those pins. But you can see here all these little albedo pins with their little white wax coverings, little white wax umbrella tops uh, on them, just making a, our own tiny little local difference to environmental change. Now, this work of Mim, well, there's this, another picture of the, of the albedo pins uh, to show them in, in context. Now, this work of Mim's that we've been talking about is an example of what we might, well, of, of something which is called land art. And land art is something that it's really important for you to know a little bit about. And in this next set of slides that Mim's provided for us, uh, she gives us some examples of, of some very famous pieces uh, of land art uh, that it's important for you to know a little bit about. All of these uh, artists and, and most of these artworks, uh, you can easily look up and find out a little bit more about uh, relatively easily. Uh, but the information I'm giving you here, uh, so just to give credit for Mim uh, for all this, all this information is coming from Mim's uh, notes on these uh, on these slides. And probably one of the most one of the most famous bits of land art that lots of people will have heard about is this piece by Robert Smithson called Spiral Jetty, uh, which he made in 1970. And you can already just from this picture begin to get an idea of what I mean. It's pretty self-evident, but you know what I mean by land art. It's art which is made not only about the land, but in the land and in involving the land. The land itself becomes part of the art. You're in some situations manipulating the land itself to create art about the land. I'm just going to read you what Mim says about Spiral Jetty. She says it, it is most, probably his most famous piece. It's in the Great Salt Lake in Utah. It was made in 1970 and it got flooded and it disappeared below the water level when the water level rose. But then in 1999, it appeared again. Again, this idea of change in the landscape over time being reflected in the, this, the behavior of this, this piece of art. And she says that Smithson was interested in the 
symbolic potential of a red salt lake. And the, he liked the idea of microbacteria coloring the water red like blood or primordial seas. And local legend apparently has it that this lake is connected to the sea. It's just a local legend. Uh, the lake is connected to the sea by underground channels which produce a vast whirlpool in its depths. And so he made this spiral uh, whirlpool feature on the surface. Apparently he's also interested in crystallography, looking at the idea of salt growth and the crystal structures in different minerals, some of which spiral around a central uh, point of growth. So he's taking ideas about the landscape, the whirlpool, the crystal growth, and incorporating those into this piece of art, which uses the natural materials from the area. Uh, and just to give you an idea of scale, sorry, in case you hadn't picked that up, this is this is wide enough for the, for the tr truck to drive down it and, and drop the stuff in the, uh, in the middle. So this is kind of a road width uh, piece, of, um, piece of art being constructed there. Here's another example from Mim, this is Agnes Deans. Now imagine if you were given a, a, a commission to make art in, in a space in New York City. I'll say you're commissioned by the US Public Art Fund to create an outdoor sculpture. What would you do? What would you make? Well, what Agnes Deans made was a wheat field. And as a result of her planting, she yielded a uh, thousand pounds of, of wheat, but the land was valued at $4.5 billion. And the wheat that she created on it was worth about $156. Uh, so Mim's kind of asking you here to think, well, what, why, why would you do that? What's the point here? Here you're in the banking district of New York, asked to create a, a sculpture on some, some land which is temporarily uh, available. What kind of thing would you create? Some monument to the, 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 the capitalist banking system? No, a field of wheat, something completely at odds, if you like, something completely, a complete revaluation of the land. I mean, ultimately, what really matters on this land? Is it bricks and banks and economics? Or is it ultimately growing food, growing plants, the natural uh, environment. So it's a kind of thing that, well, in, in this case, an artist has come up with an idea that might be quite different from what if you'd said to a, an engineer or an economist or even a typical geographer, and you said, oh, what should we do with this, this piece of space in this, this high value land in, in the middle of New York? What should we do with it? Uh, the idea of growing a, growing a field of wheat in it, again, think of ephemerality, time. Uh, it, it's an interesting approach to the use of landscape, a different view of how landscape can be used. Here's another great example of land art. Walter Della Maria uh, stuck lots of poles up in the, in, in the desert to catch lightning. This is lightning field. And the question that Mim uh, always asks about these, it's 400 highly polished, precision engineered stainless steel poles arranged in a grid uh, a mile a mile square grid. So it's a huge feature. There isn't actually any earthwork involved. He didn't move any, any of the, the land around. But he stuck these poles in the ground. Um, but it's, it, it, it's remote. Uh, Mim says, this, is this approaching the sublime? Because it's huge. It's remote. Hardly anyone is ever going to go there and visit it. But it's going to be catching lightning. And so he set up uh, cameras and caught the well, he, he captured on, on film the lightning being attracted to these poles but no one was there to see it and one of the questions that this raises about art and it's a question about landscape as well it's a, it's a philosophical question if no one is there to observe the landscape does that change the way we interpret the landscape we often say is mars or another planet can that really count as a, a wilderness or can there be hazards there if there aren't people there then surely all our definitions have to change well likewise with art can you have art that nobody sees or in this case is it this photograph which is the art rather than the poles catching the lightning and if it's the photograph which is the art not the poles catching the lightning then might you just as well have painted it or drawn it or in fact might you just as well have imagined it so when we talk about you making your own art later on do you actually need to be there? Do you actually need anyone to see it? Do you actually need to create it in any particular way? Or can you just imagine it and describe it? And is that then good enough uh, for creation of art? Now, I just want to draw towards a close with just, just two more artists that I, I want you to be aware of. The first is Richard Long. And Richard Long said that his intention was to make a new art, which was also a new way of walking walking as art. Each walk followed my 
own unique formal route for some original reason which was different from other categories of walking like, like travelling. Each walk, though not by definition conceptual, realised a particular idea. So you'd have an idea for a walk and the idea, is that, is that the art? Is it coming up with the idea that, that is the, art, the artistic bit? And then he would walk and the walking as art provided a simple way, he says, uh, for him to explore relationships between time, distance, geography and measurement. These walks are recorded in his work in the most appropriate way for each different idea. It might be a photograph, it might be a map or it might be a text work and all of these forms feed the imagination. So he made a variety of different uh, artworks including involving this walking uh, across the countryside or walking from place to place. One, for example, he, he might uh, walk across the countryside and backwards and forwards and, and leave a track or mark his mark his path in some way uh, as, as he travels. Uh, here's another one on, on the left where he's trampled a track into the grass in a meadow and then on the right hand side is a one hour walk on Dartmoor where each minute he identified one word, one idea, one characteristic of the landscape that he was walking through. And so you can read his walk, shadow, grass, ice, scuff, squelch, soft, blue, breathe, hollow, bank, red, pool, reeds, gurgle, swish, reflection, skyline, etc. And so it's a different way of recording the walk. These are just doing the same thing. There's one, here's one record of a walk. Here's a different record of a walk using text or using the land itself. Now, where is the art here? Is the art the act of walking? Is the art the track in the grass? Is it the photograph in the track on the grass? Is it what you subsequently think about the track in the grass? What, which part of that is the art or is all of it together art? And finally, one last artist I want to uh, introduce you to or remind you of uh, is Andy Gold, Goldsworthy. Worthy. And he uses natural materials and in many cases very ephemeral materials. So on the left hand side he's just got uh, leaves uh, in water. It's not going to last long at all. The water is going to drain away, the leaves are going to change, they're going to blow away. Um, so for him the, the record if you like is the photograph that he takes of the work. So the work is ephemeral and very clearly the photograph uh, is, is the record of that work and therefore is the long term art if you like. Now, I hope having, having just seen some of those examples of, of land art, that you have an opinion about it. I, I don't care what your opinion is. You might love it, you might hate it, you might think it's just a load of rubbish, you might think it's truly inspiring and has made you want to go out there and make some art of your own. You might see the point of it, you might not see the point of it, whatever. But I want you to have an opinion. I want you to have an opinion because I want you to now be an art critic. We're, we're looking at art as a way of exploring, seeing more on the landscape. We need to think about art itself. We need to think about our responses uh, to art. And again, in the same way that you, art isn't just for arty people, being an art critic isn't just for arty people. You have an opinion already, I'm sure, about some of those previous bits of art. Well, you are therefore already now an art critic, so you're not going to find this difficult at all. Now I'm going to give you two, well, Mim's given you two pieces of art that you can do this with. You can choose one of them or you can do both of them, what, what, as you wish. One is by Anthony Gormley and it's these statues on the northwest English coast where he put uh, casts of, of his own, the shape of his own body uh, scattered around the shoreline. Again, you, you can Google that and find out all about it, that, that huge uh, sculpture carrying a vast area where the tide comes in and out and in and out uh, day after day, submerging and then exposing the statues again. And then underneath that, a piece by Andy Goldsworthy, and this, and this relates to um, Mim's snowballs. Uh, so Goldsworthy made snowballs, he rolled up snow, collecting stuff that was just lying around in the environment in, in Scotland one winter, and then kept them in a deep freeze, these, these massive snowballs. And then the following summer, he brought them out again, put them in the middle of the city and left them there for people to watch them melt in the summer sunshine. What's that all about? So there's two bits of art there and we want you to have a little think about them and we want you to have an opinion about them. Now to help you to do that, Mim has come up 
with this looking at art document, this checklist, if you like, of questions for you to, to think about. I'll put this onto the KLE, uh, so you've got a, a copy of it that you can, if you want to, you can print it off and, and fill it in, or you can just look at it at the same time as looking at the, uh, the bits of art. But there's a bunch of questions on there just to help to guide you as you just try to look carefully at the work. And I guess that's the key thing. The, the point here isn't for you to be right in your opinion about the art. The key thing here is for you to see as much as you can, to have as, as well founded an opinion as you can. Notice as much as you can about the work and make it let it make your mind spin off in whatever direction it, it makes your mind spin off. Uh, so just develop your opinion, develop your thinking about these uh, pieces of work. So what we're going to do is, I'm going to draw this um, video to a, to a close just now, uh, have a break, uh, and during that break you can have, have a think about that um, art criticism exercise, and then after the break, or in other words in the next video, the next uh, resource that I put up uh, in, the, in this part of the module, uh, you need to get your drawing fingers ready because having thought about art, seen some other people's art, criticised some art and had some opinions about art, we're going to actually do we're actually going to do a little bit of art of our own to help us be able to notice more about some objects, some bits of landscape that we're going to be talking about. OK, thanks very much. Go and f uh, check out the rest of the resources on the KLE. And then after you've uh, had a break and done that um, art criticism exercise, move on to the next item uh, in, in the sequence.